In the 2024 Player's Handbook, plenty of classes got upgrades with a few buffs or powers here and there, and one problem they seemingly wanted to tackle in this updated but not new edition of D&D is bridging the power gap between marshals and casters. It's not a secret that 5th edition casters have always been more powerful. To me, this has never really been a problem. I don't need every single class to be at 100% parity level with each other. In fact, it seems perfectly fine to me to have power and complexity tied together so you can have a group of experienced and brand new players at the same literal table. The newbie playing the champion fighter and the expert playing the diviner wizard slash college of dance bard multiclass can coexist in perfect harmony. That's pretty cool. I've gotten off on a tangent here because today we're talking about weapon mastery. I like the idea of it because it gives you specific reasons to choose certain weapons in combat. Before, many players would tend to pick the weapon with the best possible stats. Before, there was little benefit to picking a lance at 1d10 over a great axe at 1d12, but now you might actually choose the worst damage option so you can get the topple mastery. And that's an interesting character building conundrum. Yes, I know, the Lance has 5 extra feet of reach, and you might choose it over the Great Axe because of that, but you get what I'm saying. Weapon choice is more interesting overall because of mastery. But today we're talking about how this all affects combat pace, and specifically how to streamline and adjudicate weapon mastery in combat so it doesn't slow your game down too much with a lot of extra dice rolls in discussion. I mean, it's obviously going to slow the game down some, and that will mitigate over time as we all get used to the new rules. But I'm going to make suggestions in this video how to manage weapon mastery while also reducing dice rolls needed. I'm going to give suggested mechanical changes for about half of these eight, and then offer best practices for the other ones to help keep them moving. Ready to dive in? Before we start, let me tell you about today's sponsor real quick. Don't skip this part. Trust me, you're going to want to hear this. The Game Master's Compendium of Explosive Creation is not just a captivating title, it's a new book on drive through RPG by my friend, the mastermind, Ryan Doyle from the YouTube channel for Degree Table. The Compendium is a system-agnostic handbook for both players and GMs. It's got guidance on building rich backstories for PCs and tons of sweet, juicy tables. Oh my, look at those tables. Mm, yummy. For GMs, there are tools for efficient and fast campaign creation like factions and rival NPCs and really good plot hook generators. I mean it, like quality adventure prompts that you'll actually want to use. Check the link in the description, the pinned comment below, or scan this QR code on the screen right now and don't sleep on what could be the last tool you'll ever need at your table. Now let's dig into those masteries. First up, Cleave. The rule says, if you hit a creature with a melee attack roll using this weapon, you can make a melee attack roll with the weapon against a second creature within five feet of the first that is also within your reach. On a hit, the second creature takes the weapon's damage, but don't add your ability modifier to that damage unless that modifier is negative. You can make this extra attack only once per turn. This weapon mastery property adds two separate dice rolls, two hit and damage to the turn anytime the cleaver manages to catch two enemies standing together. So how can we speed this up while still making it fun? I think the easiest thing to do here is just cut out all the extra rolling. And I would mod this ability so that if your PC has cleave and you make an extra attack against a creature and there is a second creature within five feet, you use the same attack roll for both creatures. If the attack roll would beat the AC of the second creature, then you simply apply half the total of the first damage roll to the second creature, and this seems logical to me. The Gray's weapon property says if your attack roll with this weapon misses a creature, you can deal damage to that creature equal to the ability modifier you used to make the attack roll. This damage is the same type dealt by the weapon, and the damage can be increased only by increasing the ability modifier. And since this one is more or less a passive ability, I don't think there's anything we need to do to speed this up. I might recommend to players that you make a special note of this ability somewhere obvious on the character sheet so you can easily reference the number and keep things moving quickly. Could be something as simple as writing the word grays next to your two hit number so you'll actually see it and remember it. The Nick weapon property says, when you make the extra attack of the light property, you can make it as part of the attack action instead of as a bonus action. You can make this extra attack only once per turn. 
And this is likely the most exploitable one of these, and I'm still not 100% clear on how this interacts with the light property, dual wielding, drawing and stowing weapons, bonus action attacks. This one feels gamey and I don't love it, so I don't even want to talk about it. I officially shun the Nick property. You have been shunned. Next up is Push. Push says, if you hit a creature with this weapon, you can push the creature up to 10 feet straight away from yourself if it is large or smaller. I don't think we need to fix this one in particular since it has no ongoing effect or anything to track. You just scoot the mini or the token away on the map and you're done. This is definitely more challenging than Theater of the Mind. I think I would limit it to once per turn and also add in the caveat that if you're pushing an enemy off an edge that would kill them, they get a deck saving throw to avoid it. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a party who only wants to fight on rooftops or dangerous mountain passes so they can push every enemy to their death. The sap weapon property indicates if you hit a creature with this weapon, that creature has disadvantage on its next attack roll before the start of your next turn. In my opinion, this is maybe overpowered and easily exploited. For the DMs facing a PC with this, I suggest using a mix of creatures that attack and others that cause PCs to make saving throws, or both. A good example is the simple CR2 Ghast, because it attacks, but it also has the stench ability that can't be nerfed by sap. Or use flanking and pack tactics more often to balance out all that disadvantage. Or use monsters that get multi attack since it's only the first one at disadvantage. But in my opinion, the best way to speed up sap at your table is honestly just don't use it. Or maybe tie it to proficiency bonus times per day? I don't know on this one. Let me know your suggestions down in the comments. Now let's talk about slow. Slow says if you hit a creature with this weapon and deal damage to it, you can reduce its speed by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. If the creature is hit more than once by weapons that have this property, the speed reduction doesn't exceed 10 feet. That little phrase quote and deal damage to it is interesting there. Like if you hit a creature with an arrow but it's immune to piercing damage, then you don't get to slow it. Most of the other weapon properties do not mention that phrase. Weird. Anyway, this one doesn't bog down the game too much as long as the DM is on top of it. I definitely recommend being diligent about your tracking. For in-person games, use a marker to track who is slowed. Like set a d20 on the number 10 next to a creature who's been slowed by 10 feet. Online, record that info on the relevant token because this one is only a pacing problem if you can't easily reference who is slowed and who isn't. The topple weapon property is one that includes a saving throw, so this definitely adds time. It says if you hit a creature with this weapon, you can force the creature to make a constitution saving throw, DC 8 plus the ability modifier used to make the attack roll plus your proficiency bonus. On a failed save, this creature has the prone condition. And I would speed this up by taking out the saving throw. Instead, I would rule it like this. 1. If you hit a creature with a topple weapon, and 2. If you beat the creature's AC by 5 or more, and 3. The creature is your same size or smaller, then you knock it prone. If the creature is one size larger than the PC, beat the AC by 10. Two sizes larger, beat the AC by 15. This way, you know as soon as the two hit die is rolled, whether or not to apply the effects. Finally, let's talk about Vex. This weapon mastery says, if you hit a creature with this weapon and deal damage to the creature, you have advantage on your next attack roll against that creature before the end of your next turn. Now, I don't think this one slows down the game too much as long as it's the player who is responsible for remembering who has advantage on what creatures when. In fact, it's possible this actually speeds up the game in some ways. If you know you get advantage next round against the Mind Flayer because you vexed it last round, then that makes deciding what to do on your turn easier. Maybe. Maybe it makes it harder depending on the kind of player you are. Anyway, that's a few suggestions for how to keep weapon mastery from slowing down your combat pace, because we all know that 5e is definitely not the speediest system out there. Anything we can do to keep momentum forward in the group engaged with tight pacing is going to benefit everyone at the table, because ultimately, what are we trying to do here? Have fun, right? And I believe we have more fun when the game runs smoothly. I know, I know, I'm a visionary with my super wise D&D takes. You're welcome. Don't forget to check out the Game Master's Compendium of Explosive Creation on Drive-Thru RPG. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Now go experiment to find out what makes your table hum like a well-oiled machine.